I started from the question of uh, how come some people enjoy other people's suffering so that it makes violence enjoyable, so that people find it heroic to punish people that they judge as bad. And then how come other people in the same society uh, are just the opposite. They get their joy not in believing that there's bad people that need to be punished, but they get their joy in contributing to people's well-being. So I then saw that there was quite a different language and quite a different consciousness on the part of people who behaved in the violent way as opposed to the compassionate way. And I decided to try to clarify that. What is the nature of communication that helps us to connect in a way in which we enjoy contributing to each other's well-being? And how is that process of communication different in the people who contribute to the violence of others? Then after I developed nonviolent communication, which is the language and the power usage that I saw contributing to compassionate interaction, I then wondered where the heck did we ever learn this other approach? So then I got interested in where did it all begin where we learned a way of thinking and communicating that contributes to violence on our planet. And here uh, scholars and scientists like uh, Walter Wink, the theologian, and his book The Powers That Be, and others who share his perspective, trace this back to about 8,000 years ago when various things happened. I won't go into now, but uh, we came out of it with uh, organizing ourselves in terms of where a few people who claim to be superior dominate others. Sometimes they base their superiority claiming their family was born closer to God, and so they controlled on the basis of the divine rights of kings. But whatever it is, we started to live in cultures in which a few people claiming to be superior dominated others, and that requires a language of domination a language in which you classify people in terms of what they are. Are they peons or are they royalty? Are they good or are they bad? Are they normal or are they abnormal? That way of thinking goes with domination because in a domination structure, the people who claim to be on the top claim to know what is right and what is wrong, and they maintain their power through the use of power over tactics such as punishment, reward, guilt, shame, and so they need a language that justifies the use of uh, punishment and reward, the language of retributive justice in which you make judgments of what the other person deserves, and that is dependent on how you judge them, whether good or bad, right or wrong, and so forth. So that's how I think it all began about 8,000 years ago when we started to have domination structures in which a few people dominated many. Before that, when we were more in the hunter-gatherer style of uh, society, uh, people that I trust uh, in their studies anthropologically uh, tell me we didn't have violence in the rate that we have since. So uh, nonviolent communication now tries to get us back to what I think is a more natural way of communicating. So it's, it's an, I think where we've gotten is an evolutionary snag, where we've gotten stuck on the basis of some unfortunate learning over 8,000 years. And nonviolent communication helps us come back to life, back to a more natural way of living, where the, our evaluations are on the basis of how needs are, are served. Are we meeting our needs and the needs of others, rather than who is what, or who's right, who's wrong, who's good and who's bad? No. Are our needs getting met? And if not, what can we do so that everyone's needs get met? That's the language of nonviolent communication. Our training is based on the assumption that the kind of beliefs and judgments that people have that lead them to dehumanize one another and to deny each other's rights that language, we think, is a distortion of need language that people are trying to say is that our needs are in danger. Some of our needs are in danger. But they are not given a language that helps them to say that. So they go to 
justifying this on the basis of what uh, their interpretation is of what words were that were written down centuries before. The Bible says, or the Quran says, and uh, they then tried to use these documents uh, as justifying that they are right and the other side is wrong. So when I'm mediating between two groups that are thinking that way, who are at war with each other, each time they use that kind of thinking, I translate it into an unmet need. So when I'm working with two groups, such as two tribes that I was working with in northern Nigeria that were at war with each other, and I ask, what needs of yours are not being met? And I'm confident if we can get everybody's needs clarified, we'll find a strategy for meeting the needs of people on both sides. And a member from the, a chief from the Christian tribe immediately screams across the table, these people are murderers. Uh, the other people scream back, these people have been d dominating us for 80 years. See, I asked for needs and they both gave me an analysis of the other side's pathology. Sometimes the analysis takes the form of, well, uh, our constitution says, and the other side says, no, it doesn't say that, it says, uh, or the Bible says, no, but the Koran says. Uh, so when people are, when I ask for needs and they immediately go into these intellectual judgments that justifies their position, I translate that into what needs I hear being expressed through that. So when the chief screamed, you people are murderers, I said, Chief, are you, is, are you saying that your need for safety isn't being met? You see, so I hear the need behind his analysis. And if I guess wrong, he can help me, but I'm looking for needs. But I happen to guess right, that's not too hard to guess what the need might be. He said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Then I try to get the other side to hear the need. So I said, would a chief on this side please tell me what you heard this chief said his needs were? A chief on the other side of the table screamed across the table, then why did you kill my son? You see, uh, I had been told ahead of time that three people in the room knew that somebody who had killed a member of their family was in the group. So it's not easy, even when you get people to express the needs, it's not easy to see that in the other person when you have these enemy images. So I had to work hard to get the chief from the second side to just, just hear that. Just tell me, chief, what do you hear him saying? He's saying he has a need for safety. Okay, just even that makes a big difference, you see. We're out of this intellectual analysis justifying position and we're connecting at the level of human needs. Then I helped the other side get clear what their needs were and heard by the first side. At that point, one of the chiefs that hadn't said anything jumped up and said, if we know how to speak this way, we don't have to kill each other. You see, it didn't take long, even in this culture, to, for them to, this one chief at least, to see that if you can just talk about your needs and not into this analysis of who's right, who's wrong, we can solve anything. So we not only have to get one side to say clearly what's alive in them, what needs of yours are not getting met, then I have to get the other side to connect with that. And that's not easy, even if it's a simple message, because if the other side's brain has been programmed to be diagnosing the pathology in this person, uh, even if I've said this person says he has a need for safety, I had to ask that person at least three or four times to repeat it back after I repeated it, because his first reaction is, then why did you kill my son? And then the next one was, you can't trust these people. They'll say anything. And then it took a while before I could give him the understanding he needed to be able to just hear the simple phrase. A man said he has a need for safety that isn't being met by the way some of the conflicts are being dealt with. Whew, that took a lot of work just to get that far, but once I got there. So the empathy is the second party seeing this other person's humanness. And the way we see the humanness is by seeing the needs without these enemy images clouding that. It's not easy to do that. It requires full presence to what is alive in this other person. 